Minister Ryan, you're most welcome into the House to discuss the most important topic of energy security. While there is much to be said about coming winters and the rising cost of electricity in Ireland and across Europe, I trust my colleagues to bring these issues to the fore and will instead take the opportunity to look forward to the future and prevention is the best remedy and now is the time to tackle the problems of the future. When we debated the Climate Action Bill this summer, you said the advantage we have in that is this offshore wind is a cheaper fuel now. I agree we should look at nuclear options. I would not rule out anything because of climate crisis, because the climate crisis is so severe. We must look at every option. In truth, I do not see nuclear energy developing in a, so, in a way solar or wind energy is developing, and, and the, with the costs coming down. It will never be competitive now, nuclear versus renewable, in our country because we have such a wind resource. That were your words. When we discuss costs, we speak of the euro per megawatt hour, the levelised cost of energy, a measure of the average net pre present cost of electricity generation for a source over its lifetime, used for investment planning and to compare different methods of electricity generation on a consistent basis. And herein lies one of the most overused and flawed misconceptions when it comes to decarbonising our in energy sector. Yes, utility, solar and wind have lower levelised costs than nuclear, but this is a gross oversimplification and the US Energy Information Administration, which publishes their official LCOE figures, even says not so directly compared to LCOE of wind and solar to other technology, even going so far as to show them in separate charts to discourage, compa discourage comparisons. Why is that? I've given you a copy of the, of the actual diagram uh, before we started, Minister. Let's start with solar power. It's all explained in this chart, which outlines negative wholesale energy prices. Up here, the light and dark coloured gold that your solar power and all of these other colours put together is your demand. The chart that you see down here is the value of electricity over the course of the day, the gross profit of an energy operator or producer per megawatt hour. In a traditional energy grid, without a lot of wind and solar, this value would actually go to a, higher, high, a little higher in a day when, it, when there is more demand for electricity. Basic economics, higher demand, higher price. But when you flood a market with your commodity, its value will go down. Exactly what's happening in places like California, which has installed large amounts of solar and wind. Not only does the value of electricity become depressed, it actually goes negative during peak production hours. The more intermittent sources of energy that you add to this actually depresses the value even more to the point whereby energy providers have zero incentive to continue producing unless you add subsidies, which are a drain on the taxpayer and do not reflect value for money. Either this or the systems get shut off to artificially constrain supply and inflate costs, which likewise is a poor return on an investment in renewable energy infrastructure. The amount of solar energy on the market compared to the value is, as more is added gives a steady downward tread. Wind power also is the same issue. This value drops jeopardising profitability, phased out uh, support schemes, the decarbonisation of our power system and the reaching of renewable targets, all of which is bad news for you, Minister, as well as the Minister for Finance, and not least of all, the climate. Now, of course, the usual response to this, why can't we just add ba batteries in long-range tra transmission to smooth out the grid? After all, it's windy in some places and sunny in others. Data shows that, that helps a little, but not much. Storage can help renewable profitability, but also experience diminishing returns. Modelling, that, modelling has shown that even doubling hydro pump capacity has a positive but minor impact on the value of wind power. So the key to decarbonising the energy sector is adding constant firm sources of energy, such as hydro or geothermal, which are heavily limited by location, or nuclear power. Wind and solar will be of huge benefit, but pure renewables will not be enough to get us to net zero. I understand the allure of 100% renewable, Minister, but surely you will agree that sustainable decarbonisation has to be prioritised above ideology, be it renewable only, 
anti-nuclear or any other belief which places dogma over that which best serves the Irish people. The road to zero, just briefly, the road to zero uh, emissions energy sector is being unnecessarily lengthened by the continued existence of Section 18, Subsection 6 of the Electricity Regulation Act 1999, which prohibits the use of nuclear fissions for the generation of electricity and which owes its existence to your former uh, party colleague, the then uh, Minister Sargent. I believe the banning of nuclear fissions in Ireland was a mistake, born out of anti-nuclear sentiments in the 90s, which were popularised by the fo fossil fuel industry and which tapped into the uh, passive anglophobia in this country, as it was the UK who was accepting nuclear as a tool with which to combat climate change. Minister, if it's energy security we are after, a fixed output, reliable, safe and sustainable solution can be found in clean energy provided by fission react reactors. And if that is not recognised by the government, then the public will pay the price down the line. Thank you, Chair, for your uh, patience. Yeah, thank you.